a reading from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all of its palaces of fire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the kings of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Could we sing a song of the Lord? 
if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand be forgotten. Let my tongue be silenced if I ever forget you. May my tongue A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned but whoever does not believe has already been condemned 
because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now that we've reached this midpoint of Lent, it's probably a good idea just to take a few steps back and look at the larger picture of this Lenten journey, particularly these Sunday Gospels that we've been hearing since the first Sunday of Lent. So go back three weeks ago. It was Jesus. After his baptism, he was propelled out there into the wilderness, into the desert. And as Mark's gospel told us that Sunday, out there in that wilderness, there were two extremes. First of all, there were the wild beasts, as well as the evil one who wanted to tempt him. And on the other hand, there were the angels, this ministry of angels, the power of good that's there. Jesus completely immersed himself into this world, into the condition of this world. We are all in that wilderness right now, a place of wild beast and temptation, but also the power of good is here as well to help us along the way. And then two weeks ago, on the second Sunday of Lent, was the transfiguration of our Lord, where he invited Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain. And he was transfigured. They were given a glimpse of his glory, his full glory, the resurrected glory of our Lord and Savior. And he opened their minds for a brief moment to get a glimpse of this new mind and heart that we need to have to fully embrace our Lord. And all of us are called to have those transfiguration moments in our life as well, but also with the reality that we still have to come back off that mountain, back into the world of the wilderness. And then last Sunday, we, we saw a very different Jesus, a Jesus almost of violence as he cleansed the temple, even had a whip in his hand, so to speak, as he turned over the money changer tables and those who were selling the animals for worship. And we saw that whenever there is violence in the Bible, it's always because God wants to purify us from those false gods, those idols, that we so easily like to cling to in our lives. And then we were reminded last week also that the most violent act of all in the entire Bible is the cross, the crucifixion. You can't think of anything more violent than that horrible way to die, which our Lord did for us. The greatest extreme is the cross itself. But we are also told that that cross has everything. And we are to come to that cross when we feel empty or confused or discouraged or dispirited or angry. We are to go to that cross if we want that new mind and new heart that those apostles saw in that transfiguration. We need to go to the cross. And that leads us to today's gospel. That's what we see today. 
Jesus talks about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And so we got to go, kind of go back to that story to understand what was happening there. It was during the time of the Exodus, after the Israelites had left Egypt, after they had received the Ten Commandments, and now they were wandering in that desert. And unfortunately, even though God had displayed great glory to them with his wonderful signs, they still refused to believe. They complained and they rebelled, and the ultimate insult that they hurled at Moses and really at God was, we're sick of this. Take us back to Egypt. Go back to our slavery is what they wanted. They wanted to go back to the darkness. Jesus mentions that darkness in the gospel as well, that men prefer the darkness over light. As a result of that rebellion, God stepped back for a moment and he allowed these serpents to begin biting them. And many of them got very sick and even some of them died. And then as we oftentimes do when we see the effects of our sinfulness, we cry out to God. We cry out for his love and mercy and ask him to help us. And that's what they did. They came to Moses and asked him, help us, go to God, we need his help. And so God told Moses then to make this bronze serpent and attach it to a pole and then lift the pole up. And anyone who was bitten by any of these snakes, if they look upon this bronze serpent, they will be healed, they will be saved. What God was really doing, when you kind of think about it, is he sort of rubbing their noses in their sin. The snakes are a reminder of their sin, the effect of their sin. It's a very symbolic way of saying that as well. And now they were looking upon their sin, that bronze serpent of their brokenness and of their absolute need for God as they cried out to him. And when they looked upon it, they were healed. Jesus today tells us that he too must be lifted up like that bronze serpent. And anyone who looks upon that cross with faith will recover from the snake bite of Satan. So let's be honest with ourselves. The devil has bitten all of us. We all carry within us the wounds of sin, envy, lust, anger, spiritual boredom, and those wounds we can allow to fester within us, and they will lead us to death if we don't go to the remedy. And the remedy is not ourselves. There's nothing we can do to fix it. The only thing we can do is go to the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, it's that cross which is the ultimate sign of God's love to this world, that cross that teaches us God's tremendous and infinite love and mercy. Remember what we're looking at when we look at that cross. Yes, we see the wood of that cross or we see the broken body of Christ nailed to that cross, but what are we really looking at? The same thing that those Israelites were looking at when they looked at that snake. Remember what Jesus did when he came into this world. He came into this world sinless, perfect, but he's like a huge sponge. He came into this world to absorb all sin. He took upon all our infirmities upon himself. And when we look upon that wood of that cross or that broken body of Christ, we are looking at our sin, at our brokenness. And as Isaiah the prophet reminds us, and by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. 
we need to go to Jesus on the cross. And that's why that cross is such an important, it is the most important symbol of our faith. Jesus in this gospel today makes it very clear that he did not come into this world to condemn us. You know, so often you hear people who are going through a serious doubts of faith, a crisis of faith, because they question something about God. They say, how can God, who is perfect love, how can God send anyone to hell? And that is a very wrong belief in God. And maybe this will shock us. God does not send anyone to hell. He condemns no one. We send ourselves to hell. We condemn ourselves, as Jesus made very clear in the gospel today. A person can only condemn himself when they turn away from the infinite love of God. They are choosing it. Hell is a choice. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reiterates that. It defines hell as as a real place, first of all. It defines hell as self-exclusion. In other words, we're the ones excluding ourselves from God when we turn away from him. And so what are we left with? We must come to God. We must come to Jesus. And we must come to him with great confidence. He will not condemn us if we believe in him. He won't. We heard it in the gospel. God so loved this world that he sent his son into this world not to condemn it, but to save it. Jesus is our way out of this mess. He is pure love and mercy. Mercy. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, he uses that word mercy a lot, all over the place. You know, last Friday, he celebrated his second year of being elected Pope, and on that day, I don't know if you heard this, this past Friday, he made an announcement. He's declaring a jubilee year. Now, what is a jubilee year? Well, there's two kinds, first of all. There are ordinary jubilee years in the church, and they only occur once every 25 years. The last one was in 2000, so the next one will be in 2025. Those are the ordinary jubilee years, years that have special graces. But we also have what are called extraordinary jubilee years. There's only been about seven of them in the entire 2,000-year history of the church. And many of us have been blessed in our own lifetime because there was one, the last one was in 1983. And now Pope Francis has declared one at the end of this year, beginning at the end of this year, on December the 8th, we will have a jubilee year. And not only is it going to be a jubilee year, he has named this jubilee year. It will be a jubilee year of the mercy of Jesus. Francis has been telling us over and over again, we need to know and we need to experience the love and the mercy of Christ. Too many of us, even though we believe it and profess it with our lips, don't know what it means to experience the tender love and mercy of Jesus. Do you let Jesus tell you every day? Do you hear him every day tell you in the silence of your prayer, I love you. He loves us no matter who we are. No matter what we've done, he loves us. And if we come to him on that cross, he will always forgive us. His mercy's there. It flowed from him. 
When that soldier pierced his side with that spear, blood and water flowed out. It's the blood and water of mercy, the mercy of Christ that's infinite. My friends, that's our loophole. We're always looking for loopholes, you know. There it is. It's Jesus on the cross, and we must come to him always, every day, and not just think about it. We must go to him on the cross. And so we have this beautiful jubilee that's going to be coming up, and we're doing lots of other things, yes, but this only complements all the other things that we're doing. We're trying to be a greater person in prayer. We're trying to move beyond just being a person of maintenance, but a person of a lived and living faith where we experience with excitement the love of God in our hearts, to really feel it. And that's the key to it right there, is to really know and experience it. That's the good news, my friends. That's why this is called the good news of Jesus Christ, because there's too much bad news in this world. And all we got to do is go to that cross. There's the good news. By his wounds we are healed. He is our remedy. Let us go to him always.